Welcome to the next edition of NPTEL online course on microelectronics device circuits. Uh, we will start today's module on large signal operation of operation amplifiers and second order effects. Uh, the reason for doing this module was that typically as of now we are assuming that the input to the signal or input signal to the operational amplifiers peak to peak values are relatively small and therefore when, even when you multiply that with the open loop gain of the operation amplifier, it never crosses the values of plus VCC and minus VEE. Remember in my previous discussion which we had uh, during the starting of this uh, module on operational amplifiers, you will, you will understand or you will notice that, that um, whenever you are dealing with uh, op amps, your op amps are primarily having a negative and a positive terminal and you also had uh, plus VCC and uh, minus VCC or minus VEE and you had one output terminal here. Now if you multiply typically A, say suppose this is equals to plus 15 and this equals to minus 15 and if the difference between the two signals is say 1 milliamp, 1 millivolt let us suppose and A is equals to 100 or maybe even 10 to the power 3. So I get output V out to be equals to 10 to the power 3 into 1 millivolt. So that becomes equals to 1 volt. Now 1 volt is much smaller as compared to VCC, right. Similarly, if this now comes out to be 10 millivolt, then I get 10 volt as the output. So if this is, so if V in is 1 millivolt, I get V out to be equals to 1 volt. If V in equals to 10 millivolt, I get V out to be equals to uh, 10 volt and so on and so forth. Now therefore, if this V in is let us suppose say, uh, say 20, then my V out should be equals to 20 volts, but that exceeds this value here and here, which means that my output waveform which I will get will be much larger than plus 15 which is being set by the power supply. So I, I am basically allowing the device to trip and therefore there will be uh, uh, the output waveform will be uh, clipped at plus 15. Now what we will be studying in this module is that thing only that a given a possibility that you do not you let the whole system to saturate and you allow the voltage to go beyond the permissible values then how does the MOS, uh, operational amplifier behave. So that will be the major goal of this study before that let me give you a small problem and you might try to solve it the methodology I can give it to you. Say I have an input um, this is regarding an integrator right. So I have an integrator in which the input waveform this is t equals to 0 and this is t equals to 1 millisecond and this is equals to 1 volt. So in, the, in an integrator I am giving a square wave just like a input waveform whose peak value is 1 volt and whose width pulse width is 1 millisecond then you need to calculate how it looks like. So how it will look like we need to calculate. Let me draw for you. So before that uh, if the resistance is given to be as 10 K and C is given to be as 10 nanofarads. So I get V0 T right is equals to 1 by CR integral 0 to T 1 DT where T is uh, between 1 millisecond and 0. So if you solve it I get V0 T to be equals to minus 10 T by putting the values of C and R. So if you look very carefully this is basically negative sign with a 10 so it will be a ramp. So and the voltage goes like this, this this will be typically a ramp here, ramp till how much minus 10 volts and after this it will be a straight line once again right it will be 0. Uh, so it will go to uh, it will go to 0 here. Why it will go to 0 because see you are you're integrating you are integrating it right you are integrating it. So when the so this is what you get uh, as far as integration is concerned this is how it look like right. So integration of a constant value will give you a constant output and that is the reason you will get it. Whereas if you look at the differentiator for example differentiator is basically uh, dv in dt right into RC, RC was how you looked into the differentiator which means that in a differentiator if you get a constant so for example the same profile if I have got this is the input 
then for the rising edge right rising edge my dv dt would have been very large so i would have got a spike here but when my voltage goes to constant then constant differential is always zero and therefore this will i will just see a spike here and then i will since it's coming down i will see a spike here so a differentiator looks something like this an integrator looks something like this so this is a pretty wonderful method differentiators are pretty wonderful methods for uh, generating spikes out of given waveform but differentiators are very seldom used because they influence large amount they insert large amount of noise because of electromagnetic interference and so on and so forth whereas integrators don't do that so just for the information sake this is in consonance or in continuation of my earlier discussion as far as this course was as far as this course was concerned uh, let me come to therefore the next part here and let me come to the last signal operation and let's go step by step what we will be doing here so we'll be looking into uh, large signal operation of opram we understand what is a slew rate uh, why is it important as far as uh, designing is concerned in operational amplifier design is concerned uh, we will also look into one important point that uh, we are assuming till now that uh, your uh, your loop your gain is infinitely large and your bandwidths are also large but in reality your bandwidths are always restricted bandwidths right and gains are also restricted and therefore under such a scenario how will your uh, open loop gain change and how will your input impedance and output impedance change we will also look into frequency response gain bandwidth product the concept of offset voltage and uh, uh, the concept of uh, offset compensation voltage and then a bias current right we will take one of them individually and understand try to understand the basic features of these you know, individual voltages or understanding the basic concept here you see we had just now discussed that in operational amplifier if you give an input voltage uh, my output uh, voltage will be as i discussed with you difference of the two voltage multiplied by a which means that uh, uh, it, it, if the difference remains the same right then my output voltage will be independent of the indip both the input voltages i hope you understand this point because a into v2 minus v1 as long as v2 minus v1 is held constant i don't mind and my v0 is constant output voltage is constant this is basically a sort of a linear property of the device which primarily means that in in such a scenario your amplification is independent of the input voltages but then operational amplifiers remain linear for a very limited range of output voltages right and what happens is that as you reach towards plus vcc and minus vcc in the output side you try to drive or 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 the signal tries to drive the operational amplifier into saturation right as it enters into saturation uh, there is a problem and the problem is nonlinearity comes into picture uh, to a larger extent now another limitation of operation of operational amplifier is that the output currents is limited by the maximum specified value which means what an operational amplifier remember uh, it output current is given by if it even if you take a integrator or a differentiator so if you see it will be resistance here and then the capacitance here right or maybe a simple inverting one will be easier to understand so i have got r2 and r1 here as i discussed with you suppose this is v in then v in by r is the current flowing through this resistor but since this is a virtual ground uh, i would expect to see all the current to move to this arm and therefore r2 will also have the same current here the same current will reach at the output of the current but please understand the total output current is limited by uh, power dissipation of operational amplifier right so operational amplifiers are designed to operate at optimal power dissipations now if the current is very high right it, it, the, it might it might trouble the operation of an operational amplifier and therefore you always have a limit on the total amount of current flowing through the operational amplifier in the in the output loop factor so this is one problem area which people face uh, the third third problem area is of the that of slew rate you won't be uh, as far as uh, designing is concerned in most of the cases if it's a small signal you won't be having these problems coming into picture but whenever you have a large signal model for an operational amplifier you might have these problems so slew rate is uh, is 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 primarily if you look uh, if you if you look uh, if you look very closely look at the second point will give you an uh, give you an idea if a large sinusoidal signal or a step function is applied to an operational amplifier circuit the input stage can be overdriven 
and the small signal model will no longer apply as I was saying, saying to you. Now, if there is a heavy nonlinear distortion when there is a large output signal then we define it to be as a slew rate, slew rate limited signal right. So, how do you define slew rate? The maximum rate of change at the output, the maximum rate of change possible at the output of a real op amp uh, is known as the slew rate which means that if you let me just show you then we will come back here. This is my uh, this is my definition dvo dt means uh, rate of change of output voltage with respect to time the maximum it can sustain and why I am saying it the maximum it can sustain is there is a certain specific reason for that. The maximum the reason for that is uh, that the variation of the voltage with respect to time may, 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 may let it be at input or output is always governed by the RC time constant of that particular point of that particular node. So, you cannot expect that if I give an input which is suddenly rising right like a step voltage you would not expect that the same performance will be at the output of your operational amplifier. It will be always delayed and there will be always a RC time constant available to you at the output side right. So, we define slew rate as the maximum rate of change of output voltage with respect to time which the operational amplifier can safely sustain. You make it slightly larger than that output variation and you would not get any change in the output side right or it will not be it will be actually slew rate limited output supply. So, as I was discussing with you let us suppose I have a voltage follower right I discussed this point or I discussed this circuit in your previous turn as well and let us suppose I have a voltage uh, voltage follower. In this voltage follower I give a step input which is given as vi. What I am seeing is that because of this step input I, I ideally I would have seen the output to follow the input because it is given to the positive terminal non inverting terminal and therefore, output should ideally follow like this, but because op amp has got a problem therefore, output will always be a uh, uh, like this which means that it will flow or it will rise at the maximum pace. So, if, 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 the, if the slew rates are large it will be like this, if the slew rates are small it will be something like this got my point right and therefore, these are known as slew rate limited operational amplifiers right. So, so, so they will tell you that it is basically 20 millivolts per second or per microsecond which means that for every 1 microsecond change in the output I would expect to see a 20 millivolt change in the output voltage that is the maximum the op amp can sustain. Anything larger than that it cannot be sustained by the operational amplifier right. So, this is the basic concept here which you see. Now, as I discussed with you therefore, if you look at this curve which is the last one here then this slope which you see that means, it will be it will be slew rate limited then this slope gives you the value which is omega t into uh, omega t is the unity gain bandwidth frequency multiplied by voltage must be less than equals to slew rate. So, so uh, this we will discuss later on if time permits omega t into omega t into v which v is the input voltage which is given is basically the rate of change of my output voltage and that should be always less than the slew rate. Then you will get such type of curve uh, in reality right. So, I get V0 by Vt, V0 is the output voltage by Vt which is the input voltage is 1 by 1 plus s by omega t where omega t is basically the uh, 3 dB bandwidth uh, frequency. So, if you do a transform Laplace transform of this one you get V0 inverse Laplace transform sorry you get V0 t equals to V0 into 1 minus e to the power minus omega. Into, so, 1 minus e to the power minus omega t into t into v0 is equals to v0. So, so, so you see as the time increases this quantity will drop down this quantity will increase and that is what is happening fine. So, this is slew rate dependent phenomena which you see. Now, if you what we were discussing in the previous turn was that if you have an inverting amplifier. So, I am mean inverting amplifier and then the output will be 180 degree phase shifted with respect to input and therefore, you put a negative sign in your closed loop gain. So, I get A C L equals to minus R 2 by R 1 remember. Now, what has happened is that my loop gain or my gain was considered to be very high right and therefore, my, but if, if it is not high and it is restricted by a certain value for example, A O L which is the open loop gain then the closed loop gain is related to the open loop gain by, by this, this factor right and this is what I get. Which this is what I get as the difference in the open loop gain and the closed loop gain 
So, just, just to show you this basic concept uh, as far as effect of finite loop gain is considered, let me just show to you what I am talking about and let me show you how it works out that let us suppose uh, I have a filter whose output characteristics look something like this. So, I have, this is basically your this is your 3 dB bandwidth or 3 dB uh, point and the voltage is defined as F B let us suppose where it cuts is defined as F T unity gain because this is 0 dB. This is my gain uh, V 0 by V i in dB and this is my omega or in terms of frequency you will get some value. Now, op so, so what I am trying to tell you is that open loop gain open loop gain let us suppose it, 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 it drops down or it falls then how does it influence my uh, in this thing. So, I have a low pass filter let us suppose and transfer function is given by A s equals to A 0 upon 1 plus s by omega v where omega b is basically my uh, this frequency here. So, in terms of j omega I get I in just replace s by j omega I get A 0 upon 1 plus j omega by omega b right. So, so what I am trying to tell you is that let us suppose now you assume that your frequency is increased by 10 times as compared to omega b. So, I am somewhere here right then I get a of j omega equals to a 0 into omega b by omega got the point j omega. Why because if omega is very very large as compared to omega b this quantity will be very large as compared to 1 and I get a 0 into omega b by omega as equals to a of j omega right. So, if I take the mod value of a of j omega then I get this to be as equals to a 0 omega b by omega. So, I get uh, the gain to be equals to a 0 multiplied by omega b by omega a 0 is fixed because that is the open loop gain multiplied by omega b by omega this is my sort of a closed loop gain uh, a finite loop gain which you see. Right, uh, so this gives you a value uh, for, for value. Now at omega equals to omega t, where is where you have got uh, unity gain bandwidth product, I will automatically have this equals to one, and therefore a of j omega will be approximately given as omega t by j omega, because this is one, omega b will convert to omega t and omega t by j omega I get, where f t. Uh, will be given as omega t by 2 pi right. So, this is your unity gain bandwidth gain bandwidth frequency right and therefore, uh, if you if you want to find out uh, this. So, if you want to find out the uh, this uh, the magnitude of a of j omega from this case right I get this to be equals to omega t by omega which is nothing but f t by f. So, it is the ratio of the unity gain frequency divided by the frequency at which you are trying to find out the gain the ratio of that will be equals to your uh, gain right uh, at that particular frequency. Now, that is with the consideration that your finite loop gain is al already available to you. Now, generally if this is a single pole dominated transfer function single if there is a single pole on the left half plane then you will automatically this will be around minus 20 dB per decade or minus 6 dB per octave. So, please try to find out why it is 6 dB per octave I leave as an exercise to you, but you can ask questions later on through the discussion forum, but try to find out why it can be also referred to as minus 6 dB per octave or minus 20 dB per decade provided you have a single pole on the S plane. So, if you have a single pole here then we define that to be as a uh, uh, this thing. Uh, if, if there are multiple poles for example, this com complex conjugate pole here. So, there are two poles. So, the so it will be 20 times n dB per decade I will not derive it here. So, this is minus 20 times n dB. So, you multiply 20 with the number of poles. So, if there are two poles 40 dB per decade. So, you would expect to see a steeper fall. So, larger the number of poles right more steeper will be your fall in the uh, low pass filter and better will be your characteristics you will be reaching to the much. So, the ideal characteristics is something like this right for a low pass filter. So, now you will get much more better because this fall will be very fast here 
So, which means higher number of poles means higher order of your filter, you automatically get a larger and larger value of your input profile. And that is what is known as a dominant pole approximation. This is known as a dominant, dominant pole. Right? So, this is as far as uh, understanding the dominant pole approximation is concerned. Now, if I take a closed loop control or a closed loop uh, consideration, I get R2 by R1 into 1 plus 1 by AOL 1 plus R2 by R1. I am not deriving it in the class, but this is what you get out of it. Now, you see if your open loop gain AOL is extremely high or infinitely high, then this quantity, this quantity goes to 0 and I get again R2 by R1, which is basically my initial inverting mode, remember inverting mode operational amplifier. Got the point? So, when your open loop gain is very, very high, 10 to the power 7 in ideal cases, you, you get a closed loop gain almost equal near to R2 by R1. But if your AOL is not very high, it is 10 or 20 or 30 or 40, whatever, then these also lower your overall closed loop gain, right? And that is the inverting amplifier case. Let us look at the non-inverting amplifier case, exactly the same, only thing the numerator is replaced by 1 plus R2 by R1 and you have denominator given as this. Similarly, if AOL goes to a very high value, this quantity, this quantity goes to 0 and therefore, I get 1 plus R2 by R1 as the value of your ACL, closed loop gain. Right, and as you can see the for the small signal model, this has been replaced by a voltage source of a value AOL into V2 minus V1. And this is the current source. So, I am assuming that I, so I will be assuming that I 1 equals to I 2. Uh, well, assuming or it is true in a sense true also because this is basically a high impedance node available here, right. So, I have finite open loop gain, this gives me a non inverting amplifier here. Now, if I want to find out the inverting amplifier closed loop input resistance, then I have to find out uh, uh, RIF, which is I 1 by V 1. Now, if you look at this. Uh, this uh, this thing here. Uh, so, I have got R1, R2 and let us suppose I have a load resistance RL. This can be made in equivalent small signal model. So, this is my input input impedance Ri. This is my R2 which is the feedback resistance here and I have got output resistance R0 and my minus AOL into V1 because you are, you are inserting your signal to the in, inverting terminal and therefore, minus AOL into V1. Why V1? Because V2 is grounded. So, I get minus AOL into V1 into RL is the external load. If you solve it by doing simple uh, simple derivations, I get this the overall picture as the input resistances. So, sorry, uh, the, 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 so I get this plus, sorry, this will be, this will be, R, I, this will be equal to, so this will be here equal to, right. And I get 1, o, one over that will give you the value of your RIF input, input impedance for the closed loop gain. If I do a non-inverting, exactly the same happens. Non-inverting case RIF uh, 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 case comes out to be equals to uh, this one, right? And this is sorry, this is actually V i by I i, right? I i input current, and this is the input resistance one plus A O L plus R two. So as you can see, if this goes to very high value, right, your R I F also goes to a very high value, right? And that is true also. So if a open loop gain is very very high of an operational amplifier your input impedances will be also very high, right? And you can get this value here. So, as it R1, R2, RL, exactly the same as the previous case and we get this into consideration here with VD is the voltage difference between R1 and R2, right? Between this point and this point, right? We come to the non-zero output resistance. Uh, typically, the ideal op amp has a zero output resistance. We have already seen that, but uh, and the output voltage therefore is independent of the resistances seen at the output load. And that is therefore, therefore op amp starts to act like an ideal, what is an ideal voltage source? Ideal voltage source is a source which gives you, uh, which wherein you can draw any large current, but the voltage across the that source will always remain constant, right? And that was the ideal voltage source, which means that there is no loading. In reality, not true that the output, uh, the ideal op amps will have some non-zero in the resistance in the output side. As I discussed with you, therefore, the actual op amp circuit will have a non zero output resistance, which means that the output voltage and therefore the closed loop gain is a function of the load impedance, right? Why? Because, see, if, if let us suppose, um, let us suppose that output voltage is independent of load impedances, right? So, whatever your load impedance is 10 kilo ohm, 5 kilo ohm, 100 ohm, or 40 ohm, or you short it, the voltage level at that particular point will remain fixed. And so, when your when your impedance levels are say 100 kilo ohm, you will be drawing a smaller current, but your voltage remain fixed, 
right. So, when, when you want to make your output voltage independent of load impedances, then you assume that uh, op amp is behaving like an ideal voltage source. In reality, not true as I discussed with you and therefore, your output voltage will start to become a function of your output impedance, right. And therefore, when your output impedance changes, uh, your voltage will also change. It is given by this formula here, 1 by R O F to be equals to 1 by R O. R O is the 1 by R O is basically my output impedance under ideal conditions, right. But with this, you get A O L uh, coming into picture. So, if you just uh, make it, if you just uh, uh, do the reciprocal of this one, I get R O F to be equals to R O, right. And then you reciprocate this 1 plus R 2 by R 1, right, divided by A O L. As you can see, make open loop gain infinitely large and ROF goes to 0. So, ideal output output voltage will always be equals to 0. Look at the frequency response. As I discussed with you, frequency response for any of the cases will be just like a low pass filter and uh, AOL open loop gain is given as A0 upon 1 plus J by FPD. PD is basically my uh, your 3 dB point. So, FT which is the unity gain frequency is given by FPD into A and therefore, the closed loop gain is given by AOL upon 1 plus beta times AOL right uh, and therefore, you get F 3 dB equals to F P D into A 0 upon A C L O which means that 3 dB frequency uh, depends upon your F P D and also depends upon the ratio of your open loop gain and the closed loop gain right. So, if you know th if this quantity is high which generally it is then your 3 dB bandwidth is higher than F P D right and that is what you get uh, here F P D is basically my 3 dB 3 dB bandwidth and uh, FPD is my uh, F, FPD is the 3D, uh, this point where it starts to go down and this F 3 dB is the bandwidth at which uh, which you have a 3 dB gain here. So, we'll, we will again come back to this frequency response later on in a detailed manner. At this stage uh, uh, you can understand it is almost behave like a uh, like an integrator a low pass integrator. Now, gain bandwidth product um, is given by uh, closed loop gain if you look very carefully unity F F F T, F T is the unity gain bandwidth is given by C L O which is means that the closed loop circuitry 1 plus F unity, F unity is F T divided by F P D, F P D is basically my 3 dB into A L by A C L O and therefore, I get F T equals to. So, F unity is equals to F T provided I get A 0 by A C L O very very high right. So, what happens is that when you open loop your gain is higher, when you close loop it your gain falls down but your 3 dB bandwidth increases. So, your initial 3 dB was this much right and now your 3 dB has improved by this much. So, your 3 dB bandwidth is an, and that is the reason your GBP gain bandwidth product is always constant. So, in the first case without uh, when you are in the open loop conditions you automatically have your gain very very high in the closed loop conditions your gains uh, falls off drastically right ok. We come to another important issue of an operational amplifier and that is known as an offset voltage. Now, ideally if you if you remember if I if I short the input of my operational amplifier the inverting and the non inverting input then for this then I will get 0 output available to me because V 2 minus V 1 is 0. In reality not true there is some amount of DC voltage always available to me in the output side. So, I can see here the output DC offset voltage is measured open loop output voltage when the input voltage is 0 right. The input DC offset voltage is defined as the input differential voltage that must be applied to the open loop op amp to produce a zero output voltage. You got the point? So, so you see when you do not apply anything you get some voltage right. Now, if you apply a voltage in the reverse direction then this high value will go down to 0. So, this amount of voltage is input side voltage is defined as my input differential uh, offset voltage right or, or input offset voltage. Right. I can have an output offset voltage also, I can have an input offset voltage. What is an input offset voltage? At the input side the amount of voltage you need to give differential between two voltage sources, so that the output goes to 0 is my defined as my input uh, uh, input differential voltage. Uh, I will not go into details of the derivations here, but uh, typically if you look very carefully uh, the the assuming that m. So, I have a differential pair here right and it is driven by this uh, by this uh, ideal current source here and so this is the VGS 1 is the drive voltage VGS 2 and I am trying to give the voltage difference between V 0 and V 1. So, offset voltage will be given as VGS 1 minus VGS 2 right remember because these are the two inputs I am giving to the operational amplifier. Now, I am assuming that uh, 
these voltages are not equal. So, I am trying to find out the difference between the two voltages, right. So, in reality, if you look very carefully in the previous slide, if you sorry, if you go back to the previous slide, see this is the VOS I am giving here, and I have grounded this, I am giving VOS so that this goes to 0. So, with this concept, I have applied VOS as VG1, VGS1, VGS1 minus VGS2, right. This is from assuming that there is saturation, I get root of ID1 upon KN1, where KN1 is mu n C oxide W by L plus VTN1 threshold voltage of N mass uh, minus this whole quantity, where ID1 is given by this, ID2 is given by this. ID1 is the current flowing through uh, this, this arm, and ID2 is the current flowing through these two arms. If you put all these values back into this equation, do a small uh, solution, assuming that VTN1 equals to VTN2, so they cancel out, I get this uh, out, output voltage value here, right, uh, where this let me just see yes. So, I will get this output voltage where I q is the sum of the two currents which you see and delta k n is basically the difference in the value of your uh, these two values, right, difference of the these two values and k n is basically the one of the uh, k n is the uh, process transconductance parameter of uh, the uh, differential pair. As you can see here, higher the current more will be the offset uh, in a negative sense, right, because it is inverting terminal which I am giving to you. Okay, we come to the offset uh, compensation, uh, voltage compensation. So there are two methods by which you can uh, uh, compensate the offset voltages, and uh, these two compensations are externally, uh, externally compensation, externally connected offset compensation network, and uh, with the null offset terminals. So we'll won't go into details, but I'll give you an idea how it works out in a very simple manner. So you see, I have V i here, which I'm giving. I also have a 100 ohm and R1 here and 100 ohm, 100 kilo ohm here. I have a potential divider at R3. So, if I move this up or down, right, some amount of resistance will be in series to 100 kilo ohm and that will be in parallel to 100 ohm here and this will be feeding the voltage to R1. You getting my point? So, by simply choosing the potential divider network up or down, I can actually make the resistance value in a potential divider network change, right and make it exactly equals to the offset voltage. So, what I do, what I initially experimentally how, how I do it, I go on shifting this, this potential divider network up or down and check out that when V0 equals to 0. So, when V0 equals, 0 is equal, V0 equals to 0, I stop and that is my basically my input offset voltage, right. So, this is one of the methodology which people adopt across the uh, current. Then you also have an input bias current, well this is very simple, they will be generally symmetrical if, if everything is matched for the top and bottom, uh, if the input stage is symmetrical with all the corresponding animals match, IB1 will has to be equals to IB2. So, I define IB equals to IB1 plus IB2, the average current and offset current is defined as difference between IB1 and IB2. In reality, IB1 and IB2 must be equal, but, but they are not and therefore, there will be a difference. Okay. I come to bias current compensation. So, I was doing a voltage compensation there. Now, I do a, a bias compensation and this bias compensation is given by this manner by that which we have got V x and V y here and simply by choosing appropriate value of R 3, I can choose I B 1 equals to I B 2, right. I will not go into further details of this one because this is slightly higher than what uh, you are supposed to know at this stage uh, and therefore, you need not worry about from where I am getting this bias current compensation. So, let me recapitulate what we did. Uh, we were actually looking into an op amp slewing action. What is the meaning of slew, right? And uh, what is slew rate, uh, slew rate limited operation? Uh, what is the DC offset voltage, right? And how do you define DC offset voltages? What is the meaning of saturation, uh, operational amplifier saturation? What is the meaning of input offset voltage, VOS? And how can we determine the input of, of offset voltage? Similarly, what is the input uh, offset current and how can you remove it? So, this we have learned in this module and this takes care of approximately our whole understanding of you know, the analog part of the syllabus. So, from next turn onwards, we will start with the combinational logic which is the digital part, right. And for the next 10, 5 to 6 hours of our lecture which is left, we will be actually doing a lot of differential, a lot of uh, digital logic design. So, this is where we stop our mixed signal or analog block uh, out of the circuit. So, if you look at the whole structure of the course, it is first devices which is the first few weeks, one or two weeks. Then subsequently from 3 to lecture week number 7, uh, it is primarily a, a, a analog flow 
and then we have a digital flow at the last places. So, next time onwards we will start the digital flow. Thank you very much.